Before entering Derman's Southern California mansion, you have to pass through the Golden Lion Gate. Whether you're a guest or an Uber Eats driver, Lev Derman wants you to know one thing about him. He's a lion. Derman wanted you to know that he's mighty, strong, powerful, but most importantly, a king. But a king of what exactly? Derman, in Southern California at least, was the king of oil and gas. However, he wasn't always rich. Derman was born in Armenia in 1966, but he didn't stay there long. At 14 years old, Derman left Armenia and emigrated to the United States, specifically the City of Angels, Los Angeles. Derman wasn't there to be a star, however. He wanted to be an American businessman, the kind of businessman you see in movies, driving red Ferraris, living in gated mansions, and flying around in leather-seated private jets. So, when he arrived in L.A., Derman changed his name from Levin Termenzian to his current, more American-sounding name. Derman worked hard after arriving in the States and eventually built up a gasoline-based empire that dominated the Southern Cal region. Derman had a hand in every process of the gas business. He owned companies that processed the oil and turned it into gasoline. He also owned companies that shipped the gas, usually in the backs of 18-wheeler trucks. And to complete the process, Derman owned gas stations where he could sell his product to guzzlers cursed by endless L.A. traffic. It was a lucrative business and a borderline monopoly that allowed Derman to earn millions. Derman called his little empire Noyal Energy Group. He used his cut to buy all sorts of luxury items. Derman lived in a West L.A. mansion, one of the priciest real estate markets in the world. His 1.2 million Bugatti sat outside on an expansive stone driveway. And when his Bugatti wasn't fast enough, Derman could always hop into his private jet and go anywhere he wanted. He lived the American dream. But the feds wanted to know how hard Derman was really dreaming. In other words, the authorities were always skeptical of Derman and how he made his vast fortune. The feds investigated Derman throughout the 90s. Eventually, they dug up something that might take him down. Like Al Capone, they thought they could get Derman for tax fraud. The case began in 1993. Federal investigators accused Derman of a diesel tax fraud scheme. Prosecutors tried their best, but Derman was acquitted anyway. After losing the case, federal investigators took their time, waiting for Derman to make a mistake. They had to wait a whole decade, but Derman finally made a stupid mistake, one they could easily work with. One day in 2003, Derman found out a detective was following his cousin, so he confronted the officer. The meeting escalated into a physical fight, and Derman ended up punching the detective in the face. Assault seemed like a surefire way to send Derman to prison, or at least jail. However, Derman found himself acquitted once again. Investigators, prosecutors, and agents were stunned. They didn't know and wouldn't know for another decade and a half that Derman had a complex network in place to protect him from any legal repercussions. He called it his umbrella. Derman bragged about his umbrella during a meeting with Jacob Kingston. He told Kingston about his umbrella for one purpose, to make him feel comfortable carrying out a worldwide tax fraud scheme. Kingston was an energy man himself from Utah, and like Derman, his reputation was marred by controversy. According to some estimates, his dad has fathered 100 children with various wives. Kingston, by comparison, boasts rookie numbers. He has 20 kids, 13 kids with his wife Sally, and 7 with two other women. Kingston refuses to call the other two women his wives. Like Derman, Kingston grew up poor. When Kingston set out on his own, he intended to create a better life for his family. His plan revolved around biofuel energy, a production system he learned about while studying mechanical engineering at the University of Utah. After getting his PhD, Kingston built a biofuel production facility on his father's ranch in Utah. He obtained government subsidies and started funding large orders for customers worldwide. He named the company Washaki Renewable Energy. The business started well, but they had some money issues. Kingston sold his fuel to customers from all around the world. Whenever an order came in, Kingston and his crew manufactured it, poured it in drums, and chipped it out. The process sounded simple enough. However, one day, a client from India canceled an order after Kingston manufactured the oil and shipped it overseas. Now, Kingston had a large order of biofuel with no way to sell it. Well, Shaky risked a major financial hit if they couldn't make their manufacturing costs back. Kingston needed help. He contacted a recently acquainted business associate, Lev Derman. 
By comparison, Dermot had worked in the gas and oil business a lot longer than Kingston, so the biofuel maker traveled from his ranch in Utah to Dermot's office in California. Kingston told Dermot about his problem. Dermot, ever the optimist, offered Kingston a very risky and super illegal solution. At first, Kingston was worried about getting caught. The scheme that he and Dermot were trying to pull off sounded like a long shot. After all, the IRS is famous, or infamous, for not letting anyone get away with defrauding them. But Dermot was reassuring. He told Kingston they would be fine. His umbrella would protect them from any criminal conviction. The umbrella sounded like something out of a cheesy spy movie, but it was real. Dermot's umbrella consisted of several government officials, high-level law enforcement officers, and unknown individual investigators never identified. Two umbrella members emerged. Agent Felix Cisneros and Detective John Cerro Ballion both are convicted felons. Cisneros worked for Homeland Security when he met Dermot. But by the end of their professional relationship, Cisneros was convicted for using his position to sneak someone across the Mexican-American border. That happened to be Derman's business partner, Santiago Garcia Gutierrez. Derman had sent Gutierrez to Mexico to negotiate a business deal with Mexican oil giant Pemex. Derman was never charged with anything. Still, Gutierrez was sentenced to one year in federal prison. Detective Balian's charge was much worse. Balian was a narcotics officer for the Glendale Police Department. Derman enjoyed a close relationship with Balian until they had a falling out in 2016. Incidentally, a cartel member filed a report with the LAPD claiming Detective Ballion offered him and another member $100,000 to intimidate someone. Not long after the alleged request, an SUV was peppered with bullets. Derman's son was riding in the back. Investigators could never prove Ballion orchestrated the attack. However, they did have enough evidence to convict him of three other felonies. Those crimes had nothing to do with Derman, and the SoCal oil magnet escaped. Once again, Derman's umbrella wasn't stable, but he believed it was strong enough to shield his fraud scheme from the feds. He was wrong. The scheme was complicated. Derman's big solution involves taking advantage of a tax incentive law. The IRS created a tax credit to encourage energy companies to manufacture and sell alternative fuel. Derman knew the business well, and he certainly knew the tax system well. So Derman told Kingston he would buy his shipment of biofuels, but only if he could ship the fuel back out to Utah, then back to the California port and ship the drums out for a second time. Kingston would receive the tax credit each time he shipped his biofuels to clients. Derman received the same credit whenever he transported the biofuel. The credits were extremely valuable, and since Kingston and Derman didn't have to pay manufacturing costs, the credit would basically be free checks signed by the IRS. As mentioned earlier, Kingston was worried about getting caught. The scheme was so obvious. It wouldn't take the IRS long to figure out that these mysterious shipments were fraudulent. Nevertheless, Derman had the umbrella. Derman and Kingston sent millions of gallons of biofuel all around the world, then back again until the credit was to their satisfaction. They doctored transportation documents to make themselves look legit. The dynamic duo accumulated around half a billion dollars in tax credits. They also circulated three billion dollars through various bank accounts during the height of their operation. But they still needed to launder the money. Derman had a solution for that problem too, and it involved a lot of gift giving between two two fuel barons. For example, Kingston bought Derman a 2010 Bugatti for $1.8 million. They also bought each other a chrome Lamborghini and a gold Ferrari, which they proudly posed with in a photo outside Derman's front gate, where the gold lion watches over them in the background. Derman felt that his new business partner needed a mansion, so he purchased a $3 million home for Kingston and his family in Sandy, Utah. All these extravagant buys would catch the eye of any investigator. They were so blatant. Derman knew this and assured Kingston, who was still worried about getting caught, that the umbrella would hold up. Derman reinforced his umbrella by splitting $134 million between companies based in Turkey and Luxembourg. Supposedly, these companies would protect the duo if anything got dicey with federal officials. However, the umbrella couldn't hold up underneath the colossal weight of Derman's scam. Eventually, authorities caught on to the scheme. And not just any authority, the big bad IRS, who didn't take kindly to being robbed of $500 million. A small army of government agents raided Derman's mansion. They went through his business papers and personal documents and even looked at his exotic sports car collection. The agents arrested Derman and Kingston for tax fraud and money laundering not long after the raid. After failing two times, the feds got a third chance to convict Derman. A 
If they were going to succeed this time, they needed Kingston to testify against his former accomplice. He gave them everything, but only in exchange for a lesser sentence. Kingston didn't have a daring attitude like Dermot. He was a family man, albeit a triple family man, who wanted his life back to normal. Dermot, on the other hand, pleaded not guilty. And who could blame him? He still had his umbrella. Not to mention he'd never heard a jury or judge say the word guilty. This time, however, would be different. The prosecutors had a slew of evidence they could use against Dermot. But most importantly, they had Kingston's testimony. In March 2020, the jury found Dermot guilty of 10 finance-related crimes, with fraud and laundering being the primary crimes committed. Guess the third time's the charm, and it couldn't have come a moment later. A few days later, COVID put the entire world on lockdown. If Dermot's umbrella could have lasted just 48 more hours, the court would have likely pushed his trial off for a few more months, perhaps years. Who knows what kind of strings the oil magnet could have pulled in that time. Rain signifies a day inside for most people. For these three friends from Massachusetts, the rainy day was an opportunity to get rich. They were forced to forego work and instead found themselves digging up a tree. If this spot was on a pirate map, it would be marked by a big red X because under that tree, they found a box of buried treasure. The three men were a step away from appearing on the Jimmy Kimmel Show when it all blew up in their faces. In Methuen, Massachusetts in 2005, Tim Cabrace and his two friends, Barry Billcliffe and Matt Ingham, had a long day of twiddling their thumbs ahead of them. Usually, the three would be out working their roofing job, but rain forced them to find something else to do. Crebase decided he had a project they could take care of and took everyone back to his house. Once there, he showed them a shrub that he needed to be dug up in the backyard. It didn't take long for one of the men to hear a soft thud as the shovel hit something that definitely was not dirt. No longer focused on their original reason for digging, the men began to unearth a box of unknown origins. They popped the box open, finding nine rust-covered cans. The cans themselves were filled with old money. Crebase began screaming in joy over their discovery. Upon closer inspection, it was apparent that the bills were unique and very old. They had names on them that aren't generally found on money. The friends had stumbled upon a bona fide treasure that any collector would drool over. Realizing this rather quickly, they took the money to a village coin shop specializing in old money. The shop owner, Dominic Mangano, took one look at the money and closed his shop down for the day. Mangano was quoted as saying, I thought I was in a dream looking at this stuff. He knew the money he was looking at was worth a lot, and he didn't want any distractions while appraising the treasure in front of him. American banks used to print money with their name on the bills. When this practice was stopped, all the named bills became obsolete, a collector's dream. At face value, the money in the box was around $7,000. However, it was worth much more to the right collector. Once finished, Mangano valued the treasure between $50,000 and $75,000. Although there was no proof, the trio was apparently offered $125,000 by an unknown collector. Excitement attracts everyone. And there isn't anything much more exciting than finding lost treasure. That's probably why that Indiana Jones guy and Nicolas Cage keep trying to find some, right? This situation was no exception. The friends found the national media banging on their doors as soon as the word got out about their treasure. Suddenly, they were taking calls left and right from sources that wanted to tell their story. Everyone wanted a piece of this story, from national news to local papers, and the men were all too happy to oblige. Crebe said that he was excited about all the attention, calling it spectacular. He was beside himself and wasn't sure what to think. They actually disagreed with how the money would be spent and who had the final say over it. Crebase was quoted as saying, I'm the one who found it. Without my decision, nothing's going to happen. It seemed like he felt like he had control of the money and his friends were just along for the ride. While Ingham didn't involve himself in that conversation, Bill Cliff had his own opinion to voice. Bill Cliff responded to what Crebay said with, quote, if one penny is spent, we all have to agree on its use. The truth was, I handed him the shovel, I told him where to start digging. A curious side note in this story is that there wasn't much information about it out there. There's no digital paper trail of their media interviews, even though they appeared on major networks like Good Morning America and CNN. A quick Google search returns a handful of articles, but no video evidence. It's almost as if the entire thing was scrubbed from the internet. Perhaps the networks were shameful for their lack of due diligence? 
Had they looked past the headline, they would have seen the big hoax. There is some debate over why the media latched onto the story of Backyard Treasure. It could have been a slow news week, or they have been interested in the idea of headline gold. Maybe they just smelled a deeper story under the one being told by the three gentlemen. If that was the case, then they were absolutely correct because the men had a secret they didn't want anyone to find out. The money that brought them the entire nation's attention was not found in that yard, it was stolen. Keeping quiet in a situation like this would be the best course of action, but it is believed that greed caused the men to make a very simple mistake. They notified the media to try and hike up the price of their treasure, but their ploy backfired brilliantly. Police Chief Joseph E. Solomon believed the men never wanted the swarm of attention. He likened the situation to a snowball rolling down a hill. He was quoted as saying, Had they kept quiet, they probably could have sold the money and no one would have ever known. All of the buzz around them is what eventually brought their adventure to a screeching halt. As they told their story repeatedly for all the different news outlets, the police began to notice discrepancies in their accounts. The inconsistencies range from the depth at which the treasure was found to the reason they were digging in the first place. They blame the inconsistency on the telephone game concept, which states that every time someone retells a story, it'll be a little different than before. However, the police weren't buying it and began to investigate the matter. Their discovery was less of an adventure and more of a scheme. As it turns out, the men did not find the money in Crebace's yard. Instead, the three friends found it in the gutters of a barn they were working on. When they saw the money, the temptation to run away with it proved too strong. The farm was a 200-acre property owned by Sylvia Littlefield. She declined any attempts to be interviewed about the situation. Instead, her lawyer put out a statement saying they were cooperating with the police. When initially arrested, the men denied everything. They even pleaded not guilty in court. But it didn't take long for the truth to come out. Under questioning, the story began to crack apart. Before long, Crebase was singing like a canary. He told a slightly different story this time around and admitted that he and his friends stole the money from the barn. Crebase also convinced Kevin Kozak, who owned his property, to go along with the story. Ingham played in a band called Till We Die, which he planned on funding with the money. Apparently, the men's idea was to get exposure and resources for the band. Crebase even said the band would make it big and take care of them. If the trio had found the money on the streets of Massachusetts, it would have been theirs legally. However, the state law says that if you find it on someone's property, you must notify them of it. An anonymous tip to the police station started the investigation. However, the authorities were already suspicious due to the red flags. The men said they found the money underground, but it was obvious they didn't. The police don't even believe the money was found in the barn. Due to the good condition of the bills, they said it's more likely that it was stored in a dry place like Littlefield's house. The arrest of the men happened right before they were supposed to appear on the Jimmy Kimmel show. In a last minute scramble, they got Joseph Solomon to come on and talk about the case. Once the police had Crebase's confession, it seemed like an open and shut case. However, the defense attorneys for the men had one tactic that changed the course of these men's future. They argued the validity of Crebase's confession and how it was obtained. They also said there was a lack of probable cause for the trial in the first place. This cast enough reasonable doubt on the trio that the case was dismissed. Prosecutors went before a few different judges to reopen the case, but they were denied each time. A judge in Lawrence said the men were denied their right to a speedy trial, and that's why the case was thrown out. Sylvia Littlefield took the matter to civil court, claiming the men had stolen the money from her family home and wanted it back. To this day, it seems like she still has not gotten it. She even sued the city, although the outcome of that suit is unknown. Even if she could win, some of the cash would be impossible to find since it was sold to an anonymous collector. It seems like this little taste of fame was enough for the men. They all stayed out of the news up until 2016. That year, Bill Cliff had a wedding that, once again, landed him in the hot seat. During his wedding, the man was operating a drone to take pictures of everything going on. At one point, the drone crashed into two women named Nina Ellis and Kelly Eaton. Eaton claimed that the drone cracked her orbital bone and left her with a concussion when it crashed into the dance floor. Ellis claimed that she needed more than 20 stitches to close the gash in her head caused by the propellers. Both women brought up a lawsuit against the company that ran the event as well as Bill Cliff himself. The women claim Bill Cliff was operating the drone at the time of the crash, but he and his lawyer deny his involvement. 
that are conflicting reports on who was actually controlling the drone. Bill Cliff claims that he was over by the stage listening to a song written for him and his new wife, but the DJ said he saw him operating it. Searle's Castles, where the event took place, had their vice president make a statement. He claims he saw Bill Cliff flying the drone and told him to land it, denying him permission to fly it at the event. Many consider TJ6 the father of a hip-hop subgenre known as scam rap. In fact, it was TJ himself who coined the term. Scam rap is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. The songs explain how to commit credit card fraud and other scams to the listener. People have been rapping about committing crimes for 40 years now, but scam rap gets oddly specific. Some of TJ's songs basically sound like step-by-step -step tutorials for getting away with various scams. In his song Swipe Story, he describes stealing PS4s from Walmart in detail. He explains the process of making fake credit cards and lying to the cashier about why he's buying all these PS4s. Who exactly is TJ6? We don't know much about the personal life of this enigmatic rapper, but you can find a few facts online. He's 20 years old and his real name is Dallas Witherspoon. However, that's according to his Wikipedia page. Other sources refer to him as TJ Witherspoon and name unknown. He started making a name for himself in the Detroit rap scene in the late 2010s. His first breakout song was appropriately titled Dark Web and came out in 2019. The Dark Web is a haven for scams and illegal internet activity. And in the song, TJ explains how to use Tor and VPNs to access it. Why would you look up some boring tutorial on YouTube when this guy is rapping all the info you need on this track? There's more to the genre of scam rap than just TJ. He's the biggest name in the scene, but there's also the Detroit native Shitty Boys. They're a rap trio composed of Stan Will, TRD, and Babytron. It's unlikely that someone named Babytron, who is in a rap group called Shitty Boys, would have taken off in any other era of rap music. Hip-hop is kind of in a weird place right now. The trio met each other in high school. Like TJ, their songs explain different scams you can try for yourself, mostly online. They usually rap over beats that heavily sample popular music from the 80s, like Michael Jackson or video game soundtracks. Their 2019 album was titled New Year, Same Scams. TJ's rapper name isn't just a random combination of letters and numbers, nor is it his gamer tag. It may seem like that's what some rappers are doing now, but there's a reason behind TJ's stage name. It references the MSR X6, a device used by scammers to clone credit cards. It's a magnetic strip card writer that you can plug right into your computer with the USB cord. Their website describes it as being ideal for people who often travel around. They don't say that it's also perfect for credit card fraud, but it is. So that's the origin of his name. But what about the origin of his scamming and rap career? In an interview with No Jumper, TJ said that he was truly born to scam. He started scamming by selling people parsley and telling them it was marijuana in first grade. Both of his brothers had been involved with scams. One of them even went to jail for bank fraud. We guess he should have been listening to TJ's music, huh? A fate that TJ has managed to avoid, so far at least. TJ claims Detroit has a culture of scamming and that it's not uncommon for people to try scamming their way through life. TJ found out about bigger methods of fraud through the internet. When he saw people making serious money online with scams, he got serious. At 12 years old, he started scamming adults on Twitter. He would make a fake page for a warehouse and say it was a store. Then, he put up a fake location and posted things for sale. People sent him real money, but they would never get any real products like the Xboxes or TVs that TJ claimed were for sale. When the customers realized that there was no warehouse at all, it was too late. Once he'd taken this scam as far as he could, he moved on to credit card fraud. He was making so much money with his scams that he moved out of his mom's house and lived on his own. His mom, who he says was strict, probably didn't know what he was up to. When he was 15, he started rapping about his experiences as a scammer. While TJ may have been a talented scammer, the same can't be said about his musical ability. Not in the traditional sense, anyway. He doesn't rap on the beat. Most of his lines don't rhyme, and he doesn't have great production or flow. TJ got his own episode of the HBO documentary series, Generation Hustle, which covers how different people hustled for money or fame. TJ reveals that he got a $10 million record deal in the show. 
His manager also estimates that the scammer had made a million dollars before his rap career even took off. Clearly, his internet schemes were seriously profitable. There has, however, been some skepticism about TJ's origins. Was he ever really a master scammer? Wouldn't he have gotten into legal trouble by now if he was? These are the tough questions that TJ fans must ask themselves. Some people have said that TJ is playing a character. He never really lived a scam life, and instead, it's just a rap persona. TJ, of course, insists that it's all real. Since much of his scam advice is real, it lends credibility to the idea that he was a genuine fraudster. In interviews, TJ has said that growing popularity might not be good for the scam rap genre. A genre that's so specifically dedicated to promoting real crime could attract negative attention if it became too mainstream. However, he's got some skewed beliefs on how crime works. TJ believes that he can't be arrested for a scam he pulled in the past and has already gotten away with. One of TJ's collaborators, Self Made Cash, found out the hard way how untrue that sentiment is. Self Made Cash, aka Jonathan Woods, was a scam rapper arrested in 2019 and charged with wire fraud, aggravated identity theft, and possession of unauthorized access devices. Some people probably didn't even know there was such a thing as aggravated identity theft instead of just regular identity theft. His arrest led to the odd scenario of federal employees commenting on scam rap in official court documents. One official wrote about Woods claiming to be sophisticated at credit card fraud when, in fact, he isn't. Prosecutors talked about how Woods claimed to be the greatest swiper of all time in his music and on social media. It's amusing to see people with real jobs comment on this weird little rap genre. But it also raises interesting questions. Could TJ genuinely go to jail? Woods was arrested because federal prosecutors watched his music videos and went on his Instagram page. Like other scam rappers, Woods was totally open about what he was doing. Could a similar fate await TJ if he continues his scam rapping? While TJ isn't worried about the cops, there are other people he's worried about, his victims. In an interview, he said that he was worried that somebody he scammed in the past could figure out it was him and come after him. Some of them are probably pretty mad that the guy who scammed them got away with it and made more money rapping about how he scammed them. Talk about rubbing salt in the wound. Has TJ ever been arrested because there's nothing to arrest him for? Could his scams be part of a fabricated backstory made up for clout? Or is he just so good at scamming that the cops can't find anything to arrest him for? Simply admitting to breaking the law in a song, a piece of art, isn't grounds for arresting someone after all. Pusha T, for instance, has been rapping about literally nothing besides selling drugs in the 80s, and he's not getting arrested. The police have to be aware of additional evidence to arrest a rapper. Even if TJ isn't a genius scammer, maybe he's a genius marketer. He created a successful brand for himself and somehow managed to stand out among the thousands of other aspiring rappers. You don't really need to be skilled at actual rapping. All you need are people to pay attention to you. And people are certainly paying attention to TJ. The current hip-hop landscape is all about how outrageous you can look and act to get that attention. That being said, TJ has been arrested. Well, he might have been. In July 2019, after he released a music video for Dark Web, TJ was arrested on stage. At his first live performance in LA, two men wearing US Marshals jackets came onto the stage and dragged TJ off. Some fans shouted, free TJ, but others believe TJ staged the whole thing. It was just another scam. The jackets that the supposed U.S. Marshals were wearing appeared to be ones you could get at any costume store. TJ has basically admitted that the arrest was staged. When asked about it by Pitchfork, he laughed and covered his face. Could this be another example of how TJ's true genius lies in the world of marketing? Plenty of rappers have been arrested, but who can say they've been arrested at their own concert? Even if it wasn't real, it's a great way to get some headlines. TJ has fully embraced the scam aesthetic. He held a so-called scam convention where people could meet him outside a streetwear store in Manhattan. He airdropped people who came to meet him with specific advice about scams. TJ acted as a scamming guru that novices could go to and visit for wisdom about the art of fraud. By novices, we mean impressionable kids who should stay in school. In interviews, TJ has openly said that kids can use his methods to go out there and start scams of their own to get money. When asked what would happen if a fan of his got caught, he brushed it off. He said, if they get caught, it's their fault. It's hardly surprising that the founder of Scam Rap isn't particularly concerned about what happens to his fans. TJ no longer lives in Detroit. Instead, he has a son and lives in the Michigan suburbs. Maybe he just felt like moving somewhere a little quieter. 
Or maybe he had to move because he scammed everyone who lived nearby. TJ has moved on from scamming random people to scamming his own fans. Like many artists, he sold t-shirts. However, he's openly admitted to purposefully not shipping shirts to people who bought them. He said he picks who he wants to ship them to and that he scammed some people for the shirts. It's their fault for trusting a guy who literally made a career out of scamming people. It doesn't get much more brazen than bragging about ripping off your own fans. It's one thing to support an artist with a criminal past. Maybe he was just parting fools from their money. But supporting an artist who hilariously admits to scamming the very people who support him is on another level. The future of hip-hop, as it has been, is gonna be wild. Picture this. You're home on a Saturday morning after a long week of work. You'd like nothing more than to relax and decompress for the day. Suddenly, your phone rings and the caller ID reads, County Sheriff's Office. You answer it, and the voice on the other end informs you that you've missed your mandated jury duty. To make matters worse, there's a warrant out for your arrest. You'd probably want a little more information to make sure this was legit, right? Let's say you ask to speak to the caller supervisor, and he unexpectedly obliges. You're transferred to a police captain who reiterates that your arrest is imminent unless you pay a $1,000 fine. What's your next move? You still suspect it might be a scam, but is $1,000 really worth the possibility of police dragging you from your house in handcuffs? This was the exact dilemma that a 50-year-old woman named Cash Miller faced on an otherwise ordinary Saturday morning in 2015. She ultimately decided it wasn't worth the risk and ended up sending a $989 moneygram to a person who identified himself as Captain Dwight Garrison of the San Diego County Sheriff's Office. Once she sent the wire, Garrison claimed that only some of the money had gone through. He told Cash that she'd need to send another wire transfer to make up the difference or else she was going to jail. At that point, Cash has had enough. She hung up on Captain Garrison and waited out the weekend, anxiously anticipating the arrival of law enforcement at her doorstep. That never happened, so she followed up with the San Diego County Sheriff's Department the following Monday. It was then that Cash learned what she feared all along. She'd been scammed. Captain Garrison wasn't actually Captain Garrison after all. The person she'd been talking to, the one who'd pried nearly $1,000 from her, was sitting in a jail cell on the other side of the country. As it turns out, Cash had been duped by a pair of jailhouse scammers. The first person she talked to was Jesse Lopez. After getting hit with a pair of robbery convictions, Lopez was locked up in Georgia's Autry State Prison for 10 years. His cellmate, Joseph Tate, also known as Captain Dwight Garrison, was staring down a 40-year sentence of his own after he'd been caught dealing illegal substances. What compelled them to start up their scam? The answer, like most things in life, was money. As you might have guessed, being incarcerated isn't the most lucrative situation to find yourself in. There are very few legal avenues through which inmates can make money, and even the scant opportunities they do have access to ultimately reap few rewards. There are prison jobs which generally involve menial tasks like cooking, cleaning, and laundry. While an inmate may choose to fill one of these positions just to pass the time, there's very little money to be made in working a prison job. In fact, most of them only pay pennies an hour. As a result, many prisoners rely on the financial support of their family and friends on the outside. Even then, some people find themselves locked up, aren't at the best of terms with their loved ones, so they're not always an available resource either. While inmates at correctional facilities receive some money each month, it's nothing to write home about. The monthly wage they earn is less than the minimum hourly wage in most states. Cash is hard to come by in prison. Due to that financial scarcity, inmates might turn to alternative means of earning their money. In most cases, alternative means illegal. There are far more risks involved in attempting to make money outside the bounds of the law. But as Lopez and Tate discovered pretty quickly, it can also result in much higher returns. The thing that allowed the two scammers to operate their con effectively, even as they sat behind bars, was their access to phones. Smuggled cell phones proved to be the most important tool at their disposal. It's against the law to have a cell phone in prison. Therefore, inmates are forced to use a little creativity to get their hands on them. If you ask Lopez and Tate, though, they tell you it wasn't all that hard to get the cell phones they needed to run their scam. It was as easy as bribing the guards. Prison guards don't pull in the big bucks, especially not in Georgia, where they make between $15 and $20 an hour. Lopez and Tate had some disposable income, and by throwing some of that extra cash the guards' way, they got the cell phone hookup they needed. From the guards' perspective, turning a blind eye to a smuggled cell phone could net them $1,000 in just one day. When one considers their meager salaries, it makes sense why bribery proved to be so effective. 
However, not all inmates have the money necessary to get the guards on their side. For that reason, prisons have seen all sorts of crackpot schemes aimed at sneaking cell phones inside. For example, the authorities once intercepted a couch about to be reupholstered by a group of inmates receiving vocational training. Inside of the couch, they found a hundred phones that had been carefully hidden underneath the cushions. Prisoners aren't shy in their persistent attempts to smuggle in cell phones, which explains why Georgia prisons reportedly seized a total of 23,000 contraband phones from 2014 to 2015. That's nearly one cell phone for every other inmate in Georgia's prison system. Once they had the phones, the guys could operate their secret scam right from their cell. They certainly had enough free time. Lopez was the one who tracked down the individuals they targeted. His method was simple. He'd visit an online real estate marketplace like Zillow and looked up houses listed for millions of dollars. Then he cold called any homeowners in the surrounding neighborhoods. They targeted wealthy people in well-off areas because as Lopez believed, it's easier to get money from people who have money. They followed a strict script when conducting the scam. Much like they did with our old friend Cash Miller, they introduced Lopez first. He posed as the clueless deputy that knew pretty much nothing about the situation. They hoped their victims would eventually ask to speak to a supervisor. That's where Tate came in. He was the sweet talker, and he knew how to manipulate people into handing over their money. Their dumb cop smart cop blueprint worked wonders, so they kept it up. To make the whole thing even more believable, Lopez used a voice over internet protocol service to make it look like the caller ID was coming from a local police department. They also used an app that redirected the call to a call center where they could utilize an automated voice over service to record whatever message they wanted. When people heard an automated message from the police, their heart rate understandably increased. Phone call after phone call, Lopez and Tate successfully convinced people that they had actually missed jury duty. Once their victims had bought into the lie that they might get arrested, it wasn't that hard to get them to pay up. They probably would have hung up immediately if the people they called knew about jury duty laws. The most common consequence for missing jury duty is absolutely nothing. It's not the best idea to skip out on your court-appointed duty, but the truth is, even if you did, you probably wouldn't get in a whole lot of trouble. There are harsher punishments that judges can hand out to people who skip jury duty. The penalties vary from state to state, and they also depend on how strict the individual judge chooses to be. There is a small possibility that you'd be issued a bench warrant. That means you'd have to appear before a judge. If that particular judge has other matters to attend to first, you may be taken into police custody in the meantime. With that said, you'd know if you'd been summoned for jury duty. Furthermore, you'd be notified before cops came to drag you away in handcuffs. In short, don't skip jury duty. But if you accidentally miss it, don't wire money to anybody claiming the cops are coming to arrest you. Even so, Lopez and Tate had a way with words, and they convinced tons of people that the cops were on their way. Getting people to send the money was only half the battle. There was still the question of what to do with all the stolen funds. That's why they recruited the expertise of a another fellow inmate named Reginald Perkins. Not only did Perkins help supply the money that was used to bribe the guards, but he was also vital in the scammer's effort to launder the money people sent them. In jailhouse terminology, Perkins was a washer, and he washed the dirty money with the help of women he befriended on the outside. He once bragged that he had 100 women across all 50 states under his employ, which wouldn't be that surprising considering how good he was at laundering money. Perkins sent the details of any money wired to one of his girls, who then converted the payment into two or three new debit cards. This practice served multiple purposes. Firstly, it distanced the inmates from the fraudulently obtained money as much as possible. Secondly, it ensured that they could access the funds even if the victim decided to cancel the payment. Lopez and Tate could use the money for whatever their heart desired with the debit cards in hand. That could mean stuff in the prison store or contraband items like more cell phones. Either way, Perkins' job was done at that point. The expert money launderer apparently washed more than $1 million for Lopez and Tate while operating their scam at Autry. After Cash Miller had called the police and learned that she'd fallen victim to the scammers, she filed a detailed criminal complaint against them. It took a little convincing on her bank's part, but she finally got her money back. It seemed like everything was back to normal, and Cash finally moved on with her life. Then the FBI called two years later. As it turns out, the authorities had been hot on Lopez and Tate's trail for some time. 
They'd finally built enough of a case to prosecute them, and they wanted Cash to testify against them in court. She said yes, without a moment's hesitation. As part of their investigation, the FBI planted an informant in Autry State Prison. His job was to collect the details of the scam discreetly. While doing so, he supplies Lopez and Tate with debit cards and cash that the FBI used to support their prosecution. Reports indicated that he'd even recorded one of their scam phone calls. They had the scammers dead to rights. 51 people face criminal charges connected to the scam, including Lopez, Tate, and Perkins. The other 48 were guards, inmates, and civilians who'd aided in the money laundering process. Over the next couple of years, most of those charged pleaded guilty, including the two masterminds behind the whole thing. Lopez ultimately testified against those who pleaded not guilty. He ended up getting just three years of probation added to his sentence thanks to his cooperation. Perkins and Tate were not so lucky. Perkins had 13 years added to his sentence, and Tate's prison term got a nice extension. Although prosecutors were happy to smother their scam, their sweeping convictions didn't scare away copycats. In 2018, a Georgia inmate was criminally charged for using a smuggled cell phone to pose as a U.S. Marshal. He told people they'd missed jury duty and demanded payment from them, just like the two guys who inspired him. Jailhouse scams aren't exclusive to Georgia either. In 2020, for example, prisoners from California stole upwards of $2 billion in pandemic relief funds from pandemic unemployment assistance. Just like Lopez and Tate before them, they used contraband phones to communicate with one another and contact co-conspirators on the outside. It seems as long as inmates have breath in their lungs and years on their sentence, they'll do just about anything to game the system that locked them up in the first place. Here are a few kids who decided to turn into scammers. Number eight, Charles Turner. When he was 19 years old, Charles Turner was booked into a Georgia jail after attempting to trick state tax collectors on multiple occasions. According to police, he tried to get them to send him a massive tax refund. And this wasn't an amateur effort. The chief investigator for the Georgia Department of Revenue told the news that he was impressed by the teen scheme. When the cops compliment your scamming abilities, you might be a natural born criminal mastermind. That being said, he wasn't good enough to get away with it. Turner was arrested at his mom's house in suburban Atlanta. Yes, he ran his entire operation out of his mom's basement. Turner had recently graduated from high school and decided to become a full-time scammer instead of doing something boring like going to college or getting an actual job. Turner did very well in school and people who knew him said he was pretty intelligent. His decisions, however, were less than brilliant. Turner set up a couple of fake online businesses that supposedly sold electronics. But instead of delivering anything, he just used his customer's bank account information and routing numbers. Turner then dramatically overpaid his taxes by almost a million dollars with the stolen money, hoping that the State Department of Revenue would pay him a huge refund. Unfortunately for Turner, there are systems to catch this scam and he never got any money. Turner attempted to overpay the government $25 million, hoping they would send him a $25 million refund. You've got to give him credit. Laundering money through the IRS is a pretty bold strategy. Number seven, Yusef Selassie. Yusef Selassie was charged with first degree grand larceny, identity theft, and many other crimes by the Manhattan Supreme Court. So what did he actually do to get hit with all that? Yusef ran a highly lucrative scheme with nothing more than his iPhone and a laptop. The unemployed teenager ran what's known as a SIM swapping scam. It's a scam where the victim's phone number is transferred to the thief's phone. Then the scammer can make or receive calls and texts as their victim. They can also change the password, locking the original owner out of their own device. As you can imagine, once you have control over someone's phone like that, there's a lot of illegal things you can do. Yusef certainly got around, managing to scam 75 people in 20 different states. But he didn't target people randomly. He only targeted certain people in certain industries that he thought would likely have cryptocurrency. He would then steal that cryptocurrency for himself, sell it on the internet for real money, and buy whatever he wanted. He ended up stealing about a million dollars worth of crypto. Yusef had pretty expensive tastes. When the cops searched his place in California, they discovered that he spent his stolen money in rather extravagant ways. He had two Rolex watches, a monogrammed Gucci wallet, a diamond ring, a diamond and sapphire ring, and six other rings with other jewels. So he may not have gotten away with his scamming in the end, but at least he got arrested in style. Number six, Canadian crypto. Youssef got away with a lot, but his operation was small time compared to one teenager from Ontario, Canada. 
This teenager, whose name isn't known due to Canadian reporting laws, allegedly stole $46 million worth of crypto from a single person. As evidenced by the fact that it has two entries so far on this list, the world of crypto has been the go-to destination for scammers in recent years. The arrest was made as part of a joint investigation with Canadian authorities and the FBI since the victim was American. Like Yusuf, this teen used SIM swapping to steal all the crypto. So how did they catch this kid? The joint investigation discovered that he used the stolen crypto to buy a rare username for a video game. Sadly, the police didn't say what game it was in the report since that would be an identifying detail. But it's still pretty funny that he was caught because he was spending money on a username he wanted. This transaction led the investigators straight to him. The true age of this scammer is unknown. The Youth Criminal Justice Act in Canada means that the police in Canada won't tell the press how old this person is. However, that does tell us that they're a minor, perhaps only 14 years old. There are definitely some pretty tech-savvy 14-year-olds out there. The investigators for the case said that this is the largest crypto scam involving a single person in Canadian history. Pretty impressive for someone who's probably in high school. And rather silly that they would risk getting caught over a gaming username. Hopefully, it was the perfect username. Number 5. Graham Clark Graham Clark also wanted to run a big crypto scam, but he wanted to get more creative than a simple SIM swap. Along with a few other scammers, he hacked into several high-profile Twitter accounts. They did this by targeting Twitter employees with phone and email scams to steal their credentials. Once they had what they needed from the Twitter employees, they went big. They hacked into 130 Twitter accounts, and we're not just talking about any Twitter accounts. They took over and tweeted from accounts owned by Apple, Uber, Coinbase, Jeff Bezos, Barack Obama, Elon Musk, Kanye, Bill Gates, and Joe Biden. They had all of these accounts tweet out some variation of send Bitcoin to this wallet and you will be sent even more Bitcoin back. People reading these tweets fell for it and sent Bitcoin to the addresses that the companies and celebrities were supposedly posting. Really? Nobody questioned why Joe Biden was asking for Bitcoin? After running the Bitcoin scam, Clark sold the login information to double his money and kill two birds with one scam. See what we did there? In the end, Clark ended up with three years in prison after stealing $120,000 worth of Bitcoin. Maybe he would have been better off sticking with the tried and true SIM swap scam instead of trying to get creative with it. Thankfully, the crypto he stole was returned to its rightful owners. Number four, Davian Daryl Mitchell. Davian Daryl Mitchell ran one of the oldest scams in the book. But unlike these lazy teenagers doing everything on their phones with crypto, he actually had to put in some effort for this scam. Mitchell sold candy to people, telling them it was to raise money for his football team. But it was actually just to raise money for himself. Mitchell ran his scam at upscale restaurants, since he knew anyone eating there would have money. No point in targeting broke people at McDonald's, after all. Mitchell would bring three kids with him to look more legitimate. He was 19, but he looked like he could be older. So the kids convinced people that there really was a school football team. Michael's problem was that he became a little bit too greedy. He kept going back to the same restaurants and eventually a manager got annoyed. One restaurant finally called the cops after growing increasingly annoyed. After all, Mitchell was selling food to their customers. That's their job. The manager told the cops that he had asked Mitchell to leave before and Mitchell threatened to fight him. Threatening to fight restaurant managers is not the best way to ensure that your scam flies under the radar. Cops found out that Mitchell did not have a permit to solicit in the city, which was pretty obvious. Mitchell only had a few hundred dollars on him when he was given two misdemeanor citations for contributing to the delinquency of a minor and solicitation without a permit. The police called the parents, who didn't care that much. They even asked the cops to leave the kids with Mitchell and let him drive them home. Not exactly the most responsible parenting. After the cops left, Mitchell and the kids went straight to another restaurant and tried their scam again. They, of course, were arrested again. Guess some people are just born to scam. Number three, Kevin Perry. Kevin Perry ended up serving a three-year prison sentence for an operation a little more elaborate than selling candy to rich folks. No, this teen was running a full-on Ponzi scheme. Perry told investigators that he was investing their money into the foreign currency market. In reality, he was taking that money and buying whatever he wanted. He would also give some of it back to investors to keep the scam alive and attract new investors. He'd take their money, and give it to the next one, and so on. It works great until people catch on. One of his clients filed a civil complaint, but Perry ignored it and continued his Ponzi scheme as planned. He kept right on pitching his scheme to new investors, thinking that the complaint wouldn't go anywhere. He was wrong. Perry ended up picking up a new investor who was actually an undercover FBI agent. He told the agent that he could turn his $10,000 into $25,000. 
the agent responded with, you're under arrest. Before its collapse, Perry earned over $400,000 through his scam. Foreign Exchange, or Forex, is one of the biggest financial markets in the world. It has a staggering daily trading value of about $6.6 trillion. These crazy numbers, combined with the speed of the market, make Forex trading very attractive to potential scammers who can promise their targets huge returns without any downside. Number two, the bling ring. The bling ring may be the most popular gang of teenage scammers in history. They even got their own movie. They were also known as the Hollywood Hills Burglar Bunch, but that's not quite as catchy as the bling ring now, is it? They were a group of seven teenagers who all lived in or around Calabasas, one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in California. The Kardashians, for instance, lived there. For about a year, these teenagers stole $3 million in cash and belongings from the house of the Hollywood elite. The biggest scores came from Paris Hilton, whose house they broke into five different times. On one occasion, they made off with $2 million worth of her belongings. Other high-profile victims of their crime spree included Orlando Bloom, Lindsay Lohan, and Megan Fox. Check out our in-depth video on the bling ring to learn more about Hollywood's teenage criminal masterminds by clicking here. Number one, Trey Brown. Trey Brown only worked out of Kroger in Georgia for two weeks, but they were the most lucrative two weeks of his life. He scammed them out of almost $1 million during his short stint with the grocery store. The 19 year old made a lot more than minimum wage. Well, until he got caught anyway. Brown went beyond just taking cash out of the register since there was only so much you could make lifting 20s. He created a ton of fake returns for items that weren't actually existing and put them on credit cards. The returns ranged wildly in price, anywhere from 75 bucks to $87,000. Maybe he thought that he would go under the radar by faking small returns as well. He bought multiple cars, clothes, shoes, and guns with his stolen money. Brown was living it up until the store caught on to the scam. Kroger corporate noticed what was happening and quickly called the cops. Brown had allegedly totaled one of the cars he bought with the money, but the rest was returned to Kroger. Todd Macaluso was first thrust into the national spotlight in 2009 when he served on the legal defense team for Casey Anthony during her now infamous run-in with the law. For those who need a little refresher, Anthony was a Florida woman who got arrested and criminally charged after her daughter was kidnapped and later found deceased. Following a contentious six-week trial, the jury ultimately found her not guilty, a decision that was met with public outcry comparable to the O.J. Simpson case. We all know they did it, but money and good lawyers can go a long way. Macaluso wasn't Anthony's lead attorney, but his close involvement with the case did raise his public profile quite a bit. The man primarily responsible for Casey Anthony's defense in court was Jose Baez, whose resume also includes defending such high-profile clients as Aaron Hernandez, Mark Nordlich, and Harvey Weinstein. What made Macaluso's involvement with Casey Anthony such a boom for his career? Well, to answer that question, it's important to understand just how significant the case was on a legal and cultural level. There's a reason it's so often compared to the OJ verdict. By the time the actual trial had gotten underway, Casey Anthony was already a villain in the eyes of the general public. The court of public opinion had made its final verdict on her long before an actual judge presided over her case. You can call it a media assassination, as Casey herself did. But whatever the reason was, people really didn't like her to begin with. They wanted her locked up, preferably for the rest of her life. The general consensus was this woman hurt her own daughter and is trying to cover it up. The way the media was portraying it, you'd think it was going to be a cut and dry case with an inevitable guilty verdict for the defendant. Casey's daughter, Kaylee, hadn't been seen by her grandparents in a month, and Casey's car smelled like there'd been a body in it. As if that wasn't suspicious enough, Casey later said she hadn't seen her daughter in a month either. She tried to blame a woman named Zanita Fernandez Gonzalez, whom she claimed to be Kaylee's nanny. But it ultimately emerged that Fernandez Gonzalez had never met the Anthonys. Even if the nanny did kidnap her daughter, why didn't she contact the authorities immediately, you might ask? That's an excellent question, and one the prosecution sought to drive home to the jury. Macaluso and the rest of the defense team had a tall task on their hands. They had to plant a seed of doubt in the jury's heads when it already felt like the case had been decided by the public. 
What they ultimately argued was that Kaylee had accidentally fallen into the family's pool, and Casey's father told her she was going to jail for the rest of her life if anybody found out. They claimed that Casey had been traumatized by years of turmoil at the hands of her father, and that her emotional scars clouded her better judgment. It was a slick way to spin what many thought to be an open-and-shut case. It's exactly the type of sleazy approach Macaluso continued to use in his legal practice. In the end, it worked. Casey Anthony got off and Macaluso became a household name, not quite akin to Johnny Cochran, but still pretty famous. Despite the notoriety that the Anthony case developed over the years, Macaluso saw it as an opportunity to propel himself and his career to new heights. There were pictures of him at Anthony's side plastered on every newspaper and magazine across the country. You know what they say, all press is good press. Macaluso got into a bit of trouble of his own before the Anthony case went to trial. He ended up withdrawing from her team after allegations surfaced that he'd misappropriated huge sums of investor money. Macaluso became the subject of an investigation by the California Bar Association, and that was the end of his involvement with Casey Anthony. Macaluso did have other claims to fame, most notably when he represented NFL standout Sean Merriman. The former San Diego Chargers linebacker was accused of domestic abuse by his girlfriend, who was none other than reality TV star Tila Tequila. The charges against Merriman were dismissed less than a week later, but that still provided Macaluso with plenty of face time. Just as his career as a high-profile defense attorney gained some steam, the fraud allegations hit, and he was ultimately disbarred in California. What exactly happened here? Well, as it turns out, Macaluso took part in a scheme to defraud his clients and investors out of millions of dollars. As was later revealed by the FBI, the shady defense attorney reached agreements with prospective investors that used his clients' personal injury cases as collateral. The real kicker was that none of his clients consented to this, and Macaluso even went so far as to forge notary stamps and signatures in an elaborate effort to convince investors to hand over millions of dollars. He actually funded his entire personal injury law practice with these fraudulent investments, which were given under the false pretense that investors would be awarded a portion of clients' future recoveries in court. Basically, if Macaluso was your lawyer and you won money in a lawsuit, he'd get his cut and his investors would get theirs, leaving you with whatever was left over. Reports say Macaluso defrauded his clients out of $70,000. He also ended up owing upwards of $1.5 million to his investors. Once he caught wind that he was under investigation, he started paying that back little by little. In 2015, he pleaded guilty to wire fraud and was ordered to pay a $100,000 fine plus $150,000 in restitution to those he defrauded. He was also sentenced to five months behind bars. As the cherry on top of Macaluso's bad news Sunday, he was officially out of a job after the California Bar Association revoked his law license. Before he'd made a name for himself backing big-name clients in high-profile cases, Macaluso cut his teeth on a specific subset of legal cases, aviation-related cases. He was supposedly a pretty good pilot himself, and he eventually became well-known for securing high-award verdicts for his various aviation clients. Court records indicate that Macaluso used his aviation expertise in less legal capacity. In October of 2016, a drug trafficking organization in Haiti came to the States looking for a plane. They needed to transport their product from Ecuador to Honduras. Apparently, this is a pretty common practice for traffickers. They'll oftentimes utilize planes that are registered in the U.S. because they assume they'll attract less attention from the authorities. Macaluso got in contact with a couple of these traffickers who were later identified as Carlos Almonte Vasquez and Humberto Osuna Contreras. They obtained an aircraft from Florida that they planned to use for their venture. However, a few days after getting a hold of it, they learned that it couldn't leave the U.S., so the search was on for another plane that could do the job, and they needed one fast. That's where Macaluso came in. In November of 2016, Vasquez and Contreras found a Falcon 10 registered in the U.S. that fit the bill perfectly. Who was going to pilot this vessel? Macaluso himself, of course. Flight records show that Macaluso flew the plane from Orlando to Port-au-Prince on November 13th. The following day, he met with the smugglers to outline a plan for transporting the product and to discuss his compensation. In the end, they settled on $35,000 as an initial deposit, followed by an additional $150,000 at a later time after the deed was done.
Not a bad haul for a day's work, but it was actually an extremely small piece of the overall pie. The aircraft Macaluso was piloting was going to be carrying 1,500 kilos of drugs. That's more than 3,000 pounds of product. How much was it all worth? Try 13 million. Let's take a minute to talk about the people Macaluso got himself mixed up with. Carlos Vasquez represented a man named Victor Pena, who brokered the deal between the supplier of the illegal product and the supplier of the airplane. His co-conspirator, Humberto Contreras, represented the traffickers overseeing the whole operation. One of the other key cogs in the scheme was Alex Duffus, who was the individual supposedly supplying the others with the actual product itself. In conversations between Pena, Duffus, and Contreras, Macaluso's name was brought up several times in connection to the smuggling conspiracy. While Macaluso was undoubtedly honored to be considered a vital member of the team, in the end, those conversations were the final nail in the defense attorney's coffin. As it happened, the Colombian drug supplier known as Alex Duffus was actually a government informant using his communications with the traffickers to build a case for their eventual prosecution. This was really bad news for Macaluso because, as we mentioned, his name had come up quite a few times during said communications. He'd also been recorded by Duffus instructing his co-conspirators about the makeup of the aircraft he'd be using to carry out the smuggling. The FBI built a concrete case against him, taking him into custody before his plane ever left the runway in Haiti. He was arrested by Haitian law enforcement, as were the others involved in the illegal plot. They were all expelled from the country and transported back to New York for prosecution. This ended yet another colorful chapter in Macaluso's storied history of getting in trouble with the law. He was ultimately sentenced to 15 years in federal prison as a consequence for his latest criminal venture. Back in 2020, FBI agents waited out a suspect in a $35 million Ponzi scheme. Matthew Piercy while he hid in California's Lake Shasta. The accused faced a mountain of charges, including 31 felony counts when he was finally brought in. The action began in the relatively calm city of Redding in Northern California. The scammer led authorities on a vehicle chase through the streets of Redding. The action picked up speed and started to get reckless. While still on busy local streets, Piercy ran off the road twice with his pursuers in tow. The chase didn't begin and end in Reading. Piercy made a bold play for Interstate 5 and headed north. The chase eventually reached Lake Shasta. When the determined man hopped out of his truck, he grabbed something from the vehicle, a point in police chases that usually doesn't end well. The object turned out to be a Yamaha 350LI underwater scooter. Rather than making that cliche the last stand, it seemed the scanner was ready to try a legitimate career in scuba diving. Piercy swam into the massive artificial canal where he stayed for 25 minutes using the scooter to go further and faster than any human swimmer. What's even crazier is this all happened in the winter. Temperatures for the area typically hovered in the area of 30 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. He might have lasted longer if it wasn't so cold. But it wouldn't have mattered. Cops had a helicopter positioned over the lake to see the crazy escape play out. When the chilled culprit finally crawled out, feds nabbed him straight away. Before taking him downtown, they were nice enough to give him a dry change of clothes provided by his wife. They even had their medical team give him a once-over to ensure he was okay before throwing the book at him. The dust in Piercy's case has yet to settle as of 2022, but official records speculate that he may get a life sentence. Piercy ran the scam that got him chased into Lake Shasta through two different shell companies, each with its own function and clientele. The two companies, of course, had several things in common. The most prominent items on the list were that they centered on wealth management and that the money they were supposed to be investing and growing went directly into Piercy's pockets. One of the two companies was known as Family Wealth Legacy, and its intended purpose is what it says on the tin. The company targeted those who were already wealthy, but looking to get richer to give future family members a head start. This is actually a pretty tame premise for wealth management and investment firms, but Piercy and his associates put a somewhat different spin on things. With a $50,000 minimum investment in the mix, the bold and risky play paid off, until it didn't. The other company was the more contemporary Zola, 
This every man's investment firm didn't target any particular audience or boast a lofty minimum like Family Wealth Legacy. Instead, the firm branched into several investment channels such as loans and real estate. There wasn't really a target audience in mind. Common folk were targeted just as gleefully as banks and even the federal government. Their joint PR efforts were the biggest uniting factor in how the two companies were run. Both were said to use an AI-based trading system for moving investments around. Termed the Upvesting Fund, this tool was supposed to use an algorithm that examined Wall Street patterns to get guaranteed returns. For about five years, this lie would be the primary vehicle driving Piercy scams. While Zola and Family Wealth Legacy were the stars of the show, a third company came into play late in the game. In 2019, long after he had discovered that he was being investigated, Piercy used false credentials to start a third shell company. On paper, this company was some sort of medical outfit operating out of Reading. In reality, it was a front for laundering funds from the two other businesses. Between those three companies, Piercy pulled down some $35 million from 2015 to 2020 when he was finally brought to justice. The scam also crossed state lines, and he started at his family's law firm in Illinois, where Family Wealth Legacy was founded. The feds eventually slapped the company with an order to cease operations, but it seemed that order went ignored. Additionally, Family Wealth Management and all of its various branches all held Delaware business licenses regardless of where they operated. The answer to how Piercy and his people made $35 million appear from thin air is actually quite simple. They started by getting in some initial investments, lying to their investors, and using early money to pay them back. They ran a textbook Ponzi scheme. But like every Ponzi scheme, the money eventually dries up. It's definitely worth noting that Piercy couldn't always keep up the facade. On many occasions, investors let him know they had enough, and he almost always had a clever response. Many victims believed their money was tied up and that reporting the company would violate their signed contract. These all came back to bite Piercy as extra charges for witness tampering. The money that disappeared off the top went to a wide range of personal affairs. Piercy bought two houses and paid off some credit cards. He also used the money to cover operational expenses for the two major shell companies. Naturally, this included paying dividends and withdrawals to customers. One of the more curious items was $1,195 spent on a Yamaha Model 350 LIC scooter. Many people don't think about single-man underwater propulsion systems very often. They're usually relegated to fictional curiosities like the gadget in the PlayStation game Ape Escape. They are, however, an authentic category of hardware. In that market, Yamaha has a strong position with multiple models. One of those sitting near the top of the heap is the 350LI that was used in this crazy escape. Its nearly $1,200 price tag puts the 350LI firmly in the top end of the market. In fact, many top picks from reliable publications come in at around half the price. That money gets you a scooter that can move up to four miles per hour in water and run for about 75 minutes on a single charge. Compared to contemporaries in the field, this one is definitely head and shoulders above the rest. Even so, it wasn't enough to help Piercy. The feds reported that Piercy entered Lake Shasta and stayed there for about 25 minutes. There were multiple instances where authorities couldn't make visual contact with Piercy and had to track him by the bubbles rising from the water. No details were provided as to how he may have been breathing underwater, if that was the case at all. One source says that a well-trained person could hold their breath without special preparations for about 11 minutes at a stretch. Bear in mind that the average person can barely surpass a minute. This feat requires serious training and conditioning. Genetics also plays a role, as does preparation. After inhaling pure oxygen, a Spanish diver once stayed down for just over 24 minutes. Even assuming that Piercy was a stellar swimmer with a talent for holding his breath, or had some breathing equipment with him, his chances of making it across were slim. Lake Shasta is roughly 35 miles on its longest side. At the pace of the Yamaha machine, he would have taken some nine hours to get across. By then, his scooter's battery would be dead, and the police would have driven around to the other side. And uh, don't forget about hypothermia. Sometime in 2018, Piercy found out that he was under investigation. Any honest business owner would have gathered any evidence of legitimacy they had and come forward. Piercy, well, Piercy did the exact opposite. Keeping transparency to a minimum was the standard for Piercy, and that didn't change when he came under scrutiny. In fact, he got even bolder. He sent a letter to then-President of the United States, Donald Trump, 
championing Zola as the troubled banking industry salvation. He even tried to get investors to join it. While this was all before the devastation that the COVID-19 pandemic wrought on the global economy, the United States wasn't exactly breaking fiscal records that year. Wall Street was a cautiously optimistic place around that time, so Piercy's proposed plan probably wouldn't have gone over too well. Not that trying to scam the entire United States government is a better plan. He would later point to this letter as the reason subpoenas were going out to staff and investors, hiding the real focus of the investigation. The Book of Proverbs in the King James Bible says, A fool and his money are soon parted. This biblical saying became apparent in Piercy's dealings with the infamous Bethel Church, a megachurch out of Reading. It's a wealthy church with over 11,000 mostly wealthy members. The twist here is that they believe very strongly that God still does miracles these days, and that's what Piercy used to get into the congregation's wallets. As a church member, Piercy had some influence on the inside. He began injecting Judeo-Christian platitudes into his businesses. His appeals definitely didn't fall on deaf ears. Church members began investing in droves, forming the bulk of his income for the two businesses at one point. None of them knew they had been taken in until it all blew up in 2020. This is even more embarrassing because it's not Bethel Church's first rodeo. The congregation has seen a similar scam in the not too distant past. 2016, a man named David Arnold Souza began scamming church members. Taking advantage of their faith, and allegedly their advanced age in some cases, Souza told members that he knew how to work the stock market. He proceeded to fleece about $650,000 from the church at large. The money went to dental work, travel, gym membership, and a rental Cadillac costing a cool $1,800 a month. He ultimately ended up netting an 18-year sentence for his scheming and was ordered to pay back about $520,000 to his victims. He won't be eligible for parole until he served at least nine years of that sentence. Kenneth Winton of Oroville started out as just another person scammed. Piercy pulled him in and had him throwing money into the pot. At some point though, things changed. Piercy invited Winton to come aboard and help him manage Zola. Before long, the two were thick as thieves. Winton was in on the scam. Winton's time at Zola started as a token role in customer service. He took on angry clients and did all he could to keep them from going to the cops with the whole thing, keeping up the appearance of a successful finance company. By 2019, he was appointed the CEO of Zola and had a hand in operating family wealth legacy. In 2020, not long before things hit the fan, Piercy handed Zola over to Winton and let him handle it as the owner. Winton ended up pleading guilty with sentencing set for February of 2021. Details on what happened to him aren't easily available, but he faced almost 20 years in jail. He'd also have to pay a $250,000 fine. Piercy, the man at the center of it all, still seems to be awaiting sentencing. Available records don't indicate any entry of a plea at the moment either. In any case, things aren't looking good for the engineer of family wealth legacy. With 31 felony counts hanging over his head, Piercy's chance of avoiding prison time are extremely low. Some of his charges carry standard penalties of 20 years in prison and a $250,000 fine. This will, of course, be in addition to any ordered reparations. With Piercy's accounts mostly drained, officials will have difficulty figuring out how to pay back victims. Piercy himself is most likely in for a life sentence, according to court documents. Jerry Cotton passed away in 2018 at only 30 years old. However, Cotton's passing was more than just an unexpected tragedy because it cost thousands of people their life savings. The loss added up to over 200 million Canadian dollars or about 137 million American. All because Cotton forgot to write down his crypto password before he died. Some online sleuths speculate that Cotton never actually passed. Instead, they think he faked it so he could steal his client's money. In all honesty, no one is 100% sure Cotton is dead or alive. The ambiguity caused a massive debate amongst true crime sleuths, especially after the Netflix documentary Trust No One came out in March 2022. The documentary chose to hop on the skeptical side of the fence and frame the theory as a conspiracy. However, it's not that simple. There's a serious lack of evidence from both sides, which has led to other wild theories growing on the internet like weeds. Some believe, for example, that Cotton's wife poisoned him for the money. Others say the mob had him whacked. Both theories are just a bit on the fringe. Instead, let's focus on the two primary theories and the bizarre stranger-than-fiction events that led up to them. It all started with Quadriga. 
Cotton's crypto-focused magnum opus. He founded the company in 2013 alongside the ever-shady Michael Patron. Supposedly, Patron handled the business side of things, while Cotton handled the tech production. Cotton was a huge computer nerd, and his friends, family, and co-workers described him as such. According to Quadriga Lore, Cotton had a vision for the future of crypto in his home country of Canada. Cotton wanted to create an investment platform for a crypto enthusiast that offered both lucrative investment opportunities and trading options. The company focused primarily on exchanging Bitcoin, which climbed in popularity back in 2013. Shortly after Quadriga's founding, Cotton's vision came to light when it became Canada's number one Bitcoin exchange. On the surface, Quadriga was booming. They had over 100,000 investors and traders, a large group by crypto standards. However, one must dive into Cotton's personal life to find the real evidence of success, evidence of him and his wife Jennifer living like crypto royalty. Cotton and Jennifer stayed together for a few years before he got big. Jennifer, or Jen, was a property manager and chihuahua enthusiast. She had two little dogs named Nitro and Gully. Together, Cotton, Jen, and their two fur babies made a lovely, unconventional family of four. They did almost everything together. They traveled together, managed money together, and bought expensive things together. Lots of expensive things. Cotton and Jen owned what you'd call the big five. Mansions, cars, private jets, yachts, and private islands. All paid for with Quadriga money. His main home was in the middle of a forested neighborhood in Halifax, Canada. It wasn't huge, only three bedrooms, but the area was beautiful, with tall green trees and pristine dark lakes. Cotton stayed there when he wasn't working or traveling. Still, he traveled a lot, often with Jen and the Chihuahuas. The family spent a lot of time in Kelowna, the heart of British Columbia's wine country in Western Canada. Cotton bought a home there and another house, his third, in Calgary. Cotton bought and built his fourth house the summer he went missing. Sadly, he never lived there while he was alive. He built the house on a private island he purchased in Mahone Bay, which is off the coast of Nova Scotia in northeastern Canada. He bought a $600,000 sailboat yacht he planned on using to traverse the eastern coast, possibly down to the Caribbean. He named it the Gulliver, after the literary character famous for sailing to strange islands. Before he passed, Cotton had just enough time, about a year, to sail the Gulliver around Mahone Bay with Jen, Nitro, and Gully, who enjoyed sitting on deck under the sun. The yacht had dining for six, three cabins, a stove, dishwasher, and a bathroom with a stand-in shower. If Cotton wasn't sailing, he was in the air. He owned a Cessna 400, rented helicopters, and kept a collection of drones. When he wasn't sailing or flying, Cotton either drove his Lexus, Jeep, or, his personal favorite, one of his Teslas. Cotton was a big fan of electric vehicles and anything innovative that challenged the status quo. His love for disruptive tech eventually led Cotton to Bitcoin. He followed crypto from the beginning. In 2009 and 2010, back when Bitcoin was just getting started in the tech world. A young college-aged Cotton attended meetings at coffee shops and dorm rooms to learn more about this new digital currency. He liked how the government or other financial institutions did not control Bitcoin. Crypto isn't controlled by anyone except the individual who can buy and sell the currency without worrying about government intervention. But most of all, Cotton was intrigued by the investment opportunities. He saw how easy it was to trade Bitcoin through different currency exchanges and how lucrative it was as an appreciating digital asset. In other words, Bitcoin would make some smart people a lot of money. Cotton planned on being one of those smart people. He created Quadriga for people like him who loved crypto and all the money-making opportunities it offered those brave enough to take it on. Quadriga was an easy, efficient way to buy and sell crypto. They were the first exchange to earn a money services business license from FinTrack, Canada's foremost anti-money laundering authority. On paper, business was going great. Things changed when Cotton went to India. According to reports, Cotton started experiencing stomach pains right after he and Jen checked into the hotel. The newlyweds had just said their vows, but instead of going to Bali or the Bahamas, Cotton and Jennifer went to India. They were there to have fun and build an orphanage for children in need. Despite the generous nature of his visit, Cotton was still spending quite a bit of change. Their hotel, the Oberoi Rajivilas, is a five-star establishment. The suite Cotton picked out cost around $932 a night. The trip was supposed to be the happiest time of Cotton's life, a luxurious experience coupled with charitable gifts. Giving. Instead, Cotton found himself in a nearby hospital having his stomach tested by doctors. The results came back with some bad news. Cotton had traveler's diarrhea. According to medical records, his symptoms stemmed from Crohn's disease. 
According to Jen, doctors diagnosed Cotton with Crohn's disease several years prior. Crohn's causes bowel inflammation, leading to chronic stomach pain, diarrhea, and gas pains. However, this pain was more than just the usual inflammation. Cotton's stomach only got worse the next day. According to his blood work, Cotton's gut went into septic shock, meaning some of his organs shut down. Not long after that, he went into cardiac arrest, not once, but twice. Doctors say they tried to revive him twice. However, their efforts weren't enough to save Cotton, who passed away. 7.26 p.m., December 9th, 2018. On December 10th, Jennifer flew back home to Canada with her husband's body after it was embalmed in India. Four days later, Jennifer held a funeral for her late husband. Several people spoke about their friend, co-worker, and business associate. Michael Patron, Cotton's longtime business partner, called him his little brother. It all sounds like a tragic ending to a successful young life, but many people, especially the 115,000 victims, think there's much more to Cotton's alleged passing than meets the eye. Emphasis on alleged. All of Cotton's investors woke up one morning to the same reality. They no longer had access to their Quadriga investments. Around 215 million Canadian dollars had suddenly disappeared, with no way to bring it back. Instead, the money existed in limbo. If Cotton was still alive, it was his to play with. If he wasn't, nobody could ever get it back. Jennifer says she looked all over the house but found no written password. There was nothing on Cotton's computer, nor were any external hard drives lying around. If you're confused about how someone could lose their account password, then let us explain. You need an extremely complicated, one-of-a-kind key code to access your crypto. Most people often stored it on a hard drive that isn't accessible by anyone else. And the only person who knew how to access Quadriga's investment data died in India from complications of Crohn's disease. In 2014, Cotton claims he wrote down all his crypto passwords in case of a disaster. A former associate says it was out of character for Cotton to not write his passwords down. Many of Quadriga's investors agreed Agreed, the lost password was strange. One investor named Ali Musavi told Netflix he felt something was off about the whole situation. He, alongside the other tens of thousands of investors, decided to investigate the matter. The first fact they found occurred just weeks before Cotton left for India. According to court records, Cotton wrote a will nine days before he died. After his passing, the will went into effect. Jennifer received the bulk of his $12 million real estate portfolio, his plane, his Lexus, and the yacht. Nitro and Gully, the couple's two chihuahuas, received $100,000 for their long-term care. It's not uncommon or illogical to make a will before marriage. However, writing a will just nine days before you die is odd, or at the very least, coincidental. The online sleuths found some issues with the events immediately after his passing to make matters more suspicious. Before Cotton's body was embalmed and shipped off to Canada, someone sent it to the hotel. In India, bodies must go right to the embalmer from the hospital. It's standard procedure. For example, hotel security guards from the hotel tried sending Cotton's body to the Mahatma Gandhi Medical College and Hospital. However, the hospital refused to embalm Cotton's body since it wasn't coming from another hospital. Documents reveal that the guards took Cotton's body to a government-run hospital where they apparently don't ask many questions. The body was supposedly embalmed there and flown to Canada. Then, they put Cotton's body in a closed casket for the funeral so no one could see who was inside the coffin, which means Jennifer was the only one to see his body. The only proof they had was a death certificate created in India. However, as the sleuths discovered, Indian death certificates are easy to forge. This circumstantial evidence led many investors to a wild conclusion. Cotton faked his passing. But there was much more to their theory than that. The Legion of Sleuths realized something else pretty quickly during their investigation. They were ignored when trying to withdraw money from their quadrille accounts. Once they started messaging back and forth, they realized that they all had the same problem. Tong Zhu is a software designer from San Francisco. The former Quadriga investor says he lost $400,000 in the Quadriga scam. He said in the Netflix documentary that he tried to pull his money out in October of 2018. However, no one from Quadriga ever responded to his emails. Even if they had Cotton's passwords, they couldn't have given Zhu his money. Why? Because there was no money. Cotton had been running a Ponzi scheme for years, long before Quadriga. At just 15 years old, Cotton started his scheme on the now-defunct website Top Gold. The scheme was called SNS Investments and guaranteed a 150% return in less than two days. SNS collapsed three months after all the investors' money mysteriously disappeared. Despite the short-lived success, Cotton remained on Top Gold long enough to meet his future partner, Michael Palton. For years, the two tech-savvy scammers, mainly Cotton, built people on the internet using a guerrilla warfare style of scamming. Cotton founded a small fund, accumulated bits of capital, then peeled 
deal out with the victim's money. These schemes were profitable, but small enough to keep him off the Fed's radar. Eventually, Hatlin and Cotton decided to team up for something much bigger, a crypto exchange called Quadriga CX. Cotton ran the exchange like his own personal casino. Financial records show that Cotton made big bets on dangerous coins like Doge, Omisco, Zcash, and Lost. When he wasn't making bad trades, Cotton spent their money on personal luxuries, luxuries he gave to his wife and chihuahuas. The only thing he left behind for his clients was a conspiracy theory for them to investigate. Lenny Dijkstra was once on top of the world. He was a famous baseball player with the New York Mets and the Philadelphia Phillies, playing 12 seasons before he retired. Once he got out of baseball, Lenny went down several different paths, most of which weren't great. He started a car wash with his brother, making more than $1 million a year. Lenny thought it was a great investment because people always needed their cars washed. He and his company would never become irrelevant. He'd later sell the business at a huge profit, but lost it all. Even though Lenny already had a multi-million dollar home, he had to have a better one. He set his sights on Canadian hockey legend Wayne Gretzky's former mansion and paid a cool $14 million for it. He joined Wall Street leader Jim Cramer to trade stocks, writing an advice column filled with baseball metaphors and all. At one point, Lenny even became an investment advisor. People paid him nearly $1,000 to get his opinions, but he said it was a steal. He claimed that people who invested with him earned $250,000 in a year based on his advice. On the surface level, everything seemed okay. Lenny's career wasn't suffering after he retired from baseball and he was making a go of it. Unfortunately, not everything was as it seemed. Lenny earned the nickname Nails during his baseball career. He was a force to be reckoned with in the late 1980s through the mid-1990s. He played with absolute abandon, running into walls and projecting a persona of greatness. It was hard to believe Lenny was anything short of amazing. Maybe Lenny manifested his greatness for a time. Lenny split his 12-year career between the Mets and the Phillies. He was a three-time All-Star player, and one year, he came in second place for MVP behind Barry Bonds. Lenny was on the New York Mets in 1986 when they won the World Series, thanks to Bill Buckner's career-altering mistake. While it wasn't his hit that won the game, Lenny was a powerhouse leadoff hitter who played a big role in the team's success. He hit a walk-off home run in Game 3 of the National League Championship Series that's still considered one of the best plays in franchise history and of his career. In 1989, Lenny was traded to the Phillies. He wasn't happy at first, but the fans quickly welcomed him. However, his career declined in 1991 after Lenny was injured in a drunk driving accident. After leaving a party, he crashed into a tree, injuring himself and his teammate, Darren Dalton. Lenny hurt his ribs, broke his cheekbone, and fractured his collarbone. He was out two months due to his injuries, only to sit out again a few months later when he rebroke his collarbone running into a wall in Cincinnati. This injury put him out for the rest of the season. Lenny was ready to take on the next year, but he was hit by a pitch on opening day and broke his hand. Over two years, he played just 145 out of 324 games. The next year, Lenny finally got his career back on track. He even led the Phillies to the World Series, though they lost to the defending champion Toronto Blue Jays. Twenty years later, we learned Lenny paid private investigators half a million dollars to dig up dirt on MLB umpires. He used that dirt to get a better strike zone during games. It's no wonder he led the league in walks and made the all-star team three years running. Lenny played his last game in 1996, but he didn't officially retire until 1998. He didn't just blackmail the umpires. He also took performance-enhancing drugs to give him a competitive edge. His life unraveled when he was named in the Mitchell Report, along with 88 other current and former players in December 2007. Regardless of the proof, Lenny didn't meet with the investigators to discuss the allegations raised against him. However, multiple sources outed him, including his brother. Lenny had sold their successful car wash business for $51 million and screwed his brother Kevin out of $4 million. In retaliation, Kevin cooperated with investigators and told them all about Lenny's use. Because he wasn't playing, anymore. No charges were brought against him. Lenny later admitted to using PEDs in a book called The Zeros by Randall Lane. He said he thought he needed to do something to keep him playing at high levels while he got older. Otherwise, he'd get replaced. While the Mitchell Report exposed his past, Lenny tried to make a future in stock trading. His skill was even endorsed by Jim Cramer on CNBC's Mad Money. A lifelong Phillies fan, Jim gave him his own stock investment column on TheStreet.com. At $999 
$2.95 a pop, customers would pay for Lenny to impart his wisdom. And they did. Some questioned his skills, but he was the real deal. According to his co-workers, Lenny followed about 100 stocks and had a research assistant to help him with the others. He made picks himself based on his knowledge and intuition and was doing really well. Then he got greedy. It was always something with Lenny. He was looking for bigger and better things. He pivoted to another career, hoping to publish a new magazine tailored to people just like him. Former athletes looking to live the high life. His short-lived stock trading career was over. Lenny swung for the fences with the Players Club and missed. He overcommitted, trying to lump an upscale magazine, charter jet service, concierge service, and brokerage and investment service all in one neat package. These efforts were targeted toward current and former professional athlete. He rolled all of his car wash money into this business venture, all 51 million of them. Lenny was so confident in the Players Club that he borrowed money left and right. He even made more than $32,000 worth of charges on an employee's personal credit card. Lenny paid his employees late, stiffed the printers, and cut corners anywhere he could. As the business spiraled, he'd scream at his employees, badgering them at all hours of the night. He behaved erratically, and his relationships deteriorated faster than his magazine in a deep puddle. Gone were the measured, calculated decisions. The Wall Street wonder was no more. Instead, Lenny he turned to lies and cons. He conned his mom, nephew, and other family members out of money, and they eventually cut him off and out of their lives. Lenny was on his way to rock bottom. At the height of his career, Lenny had a net worth of more than $58 million. Unfortunately, after a series of bad decisions, Lenny filed for bankruptcy. He claimed that he had only $50,000 worth of assets, but had more than $30 million in liabilities. Despite the best intentions, the Players Club had been a colossal failure. Instead of being the CEO of a successful company, Lenny sat atop a mountain of debt owed to various banks and creditors. All his car wash, baseball, and investing money was gone. His home was a wreck, and Lenny was accused of lying under oath and hiding assets to make his situation sound worse than it really was. Instead of facing his punishment and staying clean, Lenny continued to act out. In the months following his conviction, Lenny was charged with identity theft, drug possession, grand theft auto, lewd behavior, and providing false financial statements. He also faced accusations of passing bad checks and fraud. In the end, Lenny received a three-year sentence for all of his criminal behavior. By August 2009, Lenny had hit rock bottom. He was living out of his car in hotel lobbies, basically anywhere that would let him squat rent-free. His once dream home was in disrepair. It had water damage, missing toilets, torn up flooring and countertops, and other significant damage. He owned a second property, but it was covered in toxic mold. One of the houses was so bad that it was filled with trash and even raw sewage. Vandals made their way in, stripping the house of any valuable pieces of electric wiring. When they left, the home was a shell of what it used to be. Lenny sold his World Series ring to help pay off his debt, but it only raised about $57,000, a drop in the $31 million bucket. Eventually, his case went to bankruptcy court to help liquidate his estate and pay down the creditors. Unfortunately, Lenny fell on old habits, lying under oath and hiding assets. Because of that, he couldn't get his bankruptcy discharged by the courts. Lenny never caught a break. In 2011, he was arrested for grand theft to buy a stolen car. The next day, he was charged with embezzlement. Prosecutors alleged that after he filed for bankruptcy, he got rid of more than $400,000 worth of items from his home without permission, including fixtures, furnishings, and memorabilia. At one point, he even brought a truckload of items to a consignment store. He gutted his homes and either sold or destroyed everything he thought he could get away with. It didn't matter to Lenny, as long as it was gone. Lenny was put on house arrest after the bankruptcy fraud. He faced up to 80 years in prison if convicted of all the charges lobbied against him. Eventually, in June of 2012, Lenny pled guilty to three felonies. He admitted to bankruptcy fraud money laundering, and concealing assets. He admitted to getting rid of the more than $400,000 worth of assets that were part of the original filing. In the end, Lenny got six and a half years of prison time and 500 hours of community service. He was also to pay $200,000 in restitution. Everyone hoped that Lenny would lay low after his conviction, but that wasn't to be. All was quiet for the first few years. Lenny was officially off probation in 2014, and as a condition of his release, he was to undergo 
go weekly drug test. In 2016, he was in the tabloids again for the promotion and the release of his new book, House of Nails. No one really heard from him until 2018, when he was back in the news. Lenny alleged an Uber driver tried to kidnap him. He was in fear of his life because the driver locked the doors and sped up. The driver disagreed with Lenny's account and instead told police that Lenny held him up at gunpoint. No gun was recovered because apparently, Lenny just put his hand in a black plastic bag with a random object and put it to the driver's head to scare him. The body cam from the incident was released by the New Jersey State Police. The once beloved MLB player had been reduced to almost nothing. He has been the butt of an ongoing prank phone call joke with Barstool Sports. They call his person personal cell phone and ask him vulgar questions until he hangs up, usually cursing them out along the way. If that's the only reason Lenny is in the news, his life may be turning around, but you never know with Lenny. He just keeps getting crazier and crazier. Click to watch one of these next videos and let us know in the comments section what professional sport you'd pick to play if a genie in a bottle was able to make it happen.